Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this live introductory workshop for Maya 2013, where we will be going over the basics of using Maya, and then we'll be handling a very simple, kind of basic project to kind of get your feet wet, get you introduced to how Maya works, and give you something that you can uh, take home and show all of your friends and your buddies and whatnot, so that you can show them that you're actually a Maya user. Now, I do want to make a few very, very general announcements about how this class works. As soon as my tablet gets kind of fired up, because sometimes it gets a little stupid like you just saw. So, first off, uh, this class is going to run from around two to three hours, as you well know, which means we will be taking breaks. I try to take breaks every hour or so. If I mess that up and we go way over and folks just need a break, do not be shy. Uh, now, when I say don't be shy, I mentioned earlier, right before the video actually started, uh, to please make sure that you're logged into BuzzNet. Now, BuzzNet can be accessed at... buzznet.com. 3dbuzz.com. Now, naturally, if you are watching this on video later on and the, the workshop is not live, then you probably don't need to worry about BuzzNet. But uh, if you go over there, you can log in with your 3D Buzz credentials. You'll see the workshop chat room. Jump in and feel free to interact with your classmates. You can chat with me in there. There is also a question system available in the webinar software, as you may have seen. If you have official questions, please put them in the webinar system. If you have uh, just regular chatter, or you just want to kind of talk to people, or just, you know, have a good time, or just maybe ask an informal question that anybody in the class could answer, please do that inside of BuzzNet. I keep an eye on the question panel just as a way to keep up with things that really, really need to be addressed with uh, at least some degree of urgency. Uh, also, because this class is uh, a bit extended, it's a one-day thing, it is, it's is—it's going to be a little bit on the informal side. I hope that's okay with everybody. We are, uh, we're, we're kind of hanging out here, having a good time, and I'm going to be showing you a lot of things in Maya, but there is so much content that uh, I feel like if it's not at least a little bit relaxed, then people will start to, uh, well, their eyes will glaze over and they'll start playing some game on Steam. I know how it is. So what are we going to be discussing this evening? Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of an introductory class uh, for Maya. So we've got some basics that we've got to get out of the way tonight. We're going to start about as basic as you can get uh, with the concepts of 3D space. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I'm going to assume you've at least been exposed to this a little bit in your life. Can I ask a quick question, though? And you can answer me right there inside of BuzzNet, because hopefully you all are logged into it. Uh, how many of you are complete, uh, complete Maya newbies? You're, you're totally unconnected with Maya, and you're, you're here to learn about it for the very first time. Is there anybody in that boat? Okay, we've got a noob, we've got a one-day user. <laughs> uh, I realize there are some people in here who are taking the uh, Maya 101 six-week class. Uh, if you attended the first week, uh, please understand that the first chunk of this class is going to be a little bit of review, uh, because I've got to cover some of the same stuff. Uh, also, I do want to kind of throw this out uh, for those who uh, who should know. If I suddenly go silent, if you hear my mic suddenly go dead, uh, I've got a, a little bit of a chest cold, I've got a case of bronchitis I'm still trying to shake, and r what I'm probably doing is coughing on the other end so I don't cough in your ear, and I've just muted my mic. So I'm just kind of giving everybody a quick heads up. Just like that. So, um, we're going to talk about the basics of 3D space because there are some important points that go along with that, specifically with Maya. We're going to have to talk about the Maya user interface. Now, I'm going to be going over this uh, sort of the in, in the at a glance standpoint, uh, but there is there's a lot of depth to be had in Maya. The interface is actually kind of huge, and I don't say that to intimidate anybody, but there's a lot of things you can do with it. So, there's going to be a lot to cover. Of course, you're welcome to click through it and, and you know, take a look at everything I'm looking at, and I encourage you to do that. But uh, we won't actually be doing a project while we're talking about the UI. Uh, we're going to talk about the viewports, which I realize they're a part of the UI. I know that sounds a little bit redundant, but the viewports in Maya are pretty special, and you need to know how to navigate them and work with them. Then we're going to start getting into uh, the basics of working with 3D objects. Uh, we're going to talk about Maya's architecture. 
specifically the concept of nodes what they are how they work and how you can use them to your advantage we're going to talk uh, a bit about parenting and grouping we're gonna need this actually for our animation and really that's that's about the bulk of the major topics we're gonna hit and then we're gonna get into our project now I'm just gonna give everybody a heads up we are not gonna be building you know a big battle mech that rolls around on treads and fires missiles and shoots lasers and melts planets or anything uh, it, it will be a very very basic project just something to kinda get your feet wet and get you introduced to using Maya to produce an animation that's my goal here today uh, again though along the way this is a very laid-back environment do not be afraid to ask me any questions uh, you're welcome to make comments you're welcome to chatter with each other if you have anything to say uh, please just you know again don't be shy I feel like uh, some folks when they just get into these classes feel like they should just be uh, sitting there and you're welcome to interact you're encouraged to interact okay so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to begin primarily here on my whiteboard, just with the concept of 3D space. Now, I'm going to go way out on a limb and assume that we are all at least passingly familiar with the concept of 2D space. And if you've forgotten this from your algebra class way back when, or however long ago that was, maybe it was just yesterday, uh, 2D space is generally pretty simple. You have a, a, a space that is broken up into two axes, generally being X and Y, where X is a vertical axis, and I'm sorry, Y is a vertical axis, thank you, uh, and X is horizontal. X runs left to right. Now, in Maya, of course, you have three axes. And it's very similar to what you see in a two-dimensional grid that you may have seen on a paper, but it is handled slightly differently than many other applications. So if you're coming to Maya from other apps, this is an important thing to keep in mind. The x-axis generally goes left to right, the y-axis goes up and down, and the z-axis is generally considered to run forward and backward. Now why is that special to you? Well, if you're coming to Maya from other applications such as uh, 3ds Max, uh, perhaps UDK, or Blender, or several others, you're used to the z-axis actually being up and down and Y actually being out here. And that's not the way Maya works. Maya uses the Y axis to point up and down. Now this is all kind of a philosophical question, uh, why they decided to do it this way. When you look at a two-dimensional grid, consider a piece of paper that's broken up into a grid with X running horizontally and Y running up and down. Uh, the folks at uh, Alias Wavefront way back in the day simply decided that they wanted to picture this piece of paper, this grid, as if you were holding it out in front of you, where uh, the paper was actually oriented up and down. However, uh, the people who made 3ds Max and UDK and Blender uh, all decided that it was better to consider the piece of paper laying flat on the table where the z-axis is pointing up in the air because the paper is laying flat. And you just have to decide uh, for yourself whether or not you can, you can gel with that. But just please understand that in Maya, Y is your up axis. Maya is a Y up world. I just I like to, to kind of beat that one in because if you are coming into Maya hoping to make models for say UDK then there will be a conversion process and your Y will become up however if you're making them for Unity Unity uses Y up just like Maya so it's just one of those things you have to pay attention to what type of coordinate system uh, you're using with your software now I will point this out oh, let's let's not look at that right now let's just do a new new scene <laughs> that was totally unintentional, I promise. Uh, you can, over inside of Maya, jump into your settings under your preferences window. If you want to see how to do this, you can go under Window, Settings, Preferences, and look under your preferences. Or there's this tiny little icon by default in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. It looks like a little red running dude from like the old Intellivision days, or at least that's what I see when I look at it. And uh, if you click on the settings submenu, and I'm getting all kinds of messages from all sorts of people, uh, then you can see the up axis currently set to Y. You can choose to set this to Z. I do not recommend that you do this, though, um, because I have seen, and uh, you know, this is been a few years ago, I've been using Maya for quite a long time, uh, but I have seen where switching your coordinate system to Z up causes some tools to behave in kind of a funny manner. So generally, I would highly recommend you just get used to it being a Y up world and go on from there. All right, 
Back over here inside of Maya. Also, one uh, inside of Photoshop. Thank you. Uh, one more thing I want to mention, and this is just uh, kind of food for thought, something to keep in mind. And it won't matter to you if you're not exporting anything from Maya. But like, again, like let's say you're coming into this hoping you can make meshes for UDK uh, or for uh, for, un, for Unity or, or any other application. You're going to be pulling models and whatnot out of Maya. Please understand that by default, and you can change this, of course, but by default, Maya's base unit is a centimeter. Make sure you know that. Uh, just so if you if you need some sort of real life scale, uh, whenever you just see random numbers uh, if, for measurements in terms of uh, length or height or anything like that, those are all going to be in centimeters by default. Okay, so that's the basics of 3D space and that's pretty boring, but you gotta kind of at least be exposed to it, so we're gonna go ahead and get out of there as quick as we can. And now we get to talk about the Maya user interface. Now, is there anybody here who's frightened by the Maya user interface? Just be honest, tell me over inside of BuzzNet, does it scare you? It doesn't scare me as much as it used to, uh, because, well, it's it's dark these days. You know, something about the dark interface just makes me kind of happy. And uh, NATO's the only person who's scared, so none of you guys are, are scared by the interface. That's good. <laughs> That's very happy. We could all point and laugh at NATO, though, because he's a bit of a fraidy cat, I suppose. Now, what I want to do is give kind of a quick rundown of the interface. I don't want to spend a, a ton of time on it. We're going to be using uh, different parts kind of as we move forward, but I believe there are some aspects of it that you need to know as we go in. So what I like to do is break the, uh, the interface up into its key areas, and I'm not just going to point them out and tell you what they are. Uh, I have decided or, and I have experienced that sometimes doing that leads to a situation where it's difficult to remember what's what. So I like to draw diagrams. I'm a big fan of drawing diagrams. So, up across the top of the Maya interface, we have the main menu bar, which is a lot cooler than you might be thinking. It is a menu bar, just like many other menu bars that you've used uh, across many other applications, but it does have some special features that you need to be aware of, and we'll be hitting on those. Underneath that, you have something that looks kind of like a toolbar from many other apps, but it's not. This is called the status line, and its job is really to tell you what state Maya is currently in. Uh, so as you change various settings uh, in Maya, the status line will update to let you know kind of uh, what has been set and why you can or cannot do a particular operation. The next line under this is the shelf. Now I have to jump down because of the way the UI is divided, so I'm going to jump all the way to the bottom. We have the time slider. Of course, this is how you scrub through your frames for animation. We'll talk about this in just a moment. We have the range slider. It's kind of like the zoom tool for your time slider. We have the command line. And we have the helpline. Now, this big section up here has a few divisions as well. We have the toolbox. And over here on the far side, we have a part of the interface which kind of updates from time to time. It is either going to be what is called the channel box and layer editor. Or it's going to be the attribute editor. And we'll talk about the difference between those very shortly. Now, of course, this great big space here, this is the viewport, which is certainly one of the more important features inside of Maya. As a matter of fact, I'm going to kind of break away from my usual convention. And just so that everybody has something to do, we're going to talk about the viewport first. So let's all open Maya. Think. And here I am inside of a brand new file, and I'm going to give myself something to look at first thing. So I'm not just sitting here staring at a blank scene. It'd be nice if we had something we could look at. So, this little tabbed area just above your viewport, 
and hopefully you see this. If for some reason you don't see the same interface that I do, I would highly recommend you go under Window, Settings, I'm sorry, not, go to, I'm sorry, Display UI Elements and say Restore UI Elements. Sorry, I'm kind of off in space. You can go uh, into the Preferences and do the same thing, but if you go under Display UI Elements and Restore your UI Elements, that allows you to do it in one nice quick click. So make sure you do that and you see the same interface that I do. So in your shelf, which is this tabbed area right up here, I want you to click on Polygons and then click on Sphere. So it's Polygon Sphere. It's pretty easy to see it from the icon. And you're going to get a tooltip right here in the middle of the screen. It says drag on the grid. Well, that's pretty easy. So just click and drag and you get a sphere. Voila! It should be a wireframe sphere if you haven't pushed any buttons or made any changes to uh, the viewport for any reason. And before we do anything else, let's talk about how the viewport displays. By default, when you first open up Maya, uh, you will be looking at the wireframe viewport. Now you can change that to a shaded view by hitting the 5 key. You can change to a textured view with the 6 key, and I'll talk about how that works here in just a second. And then a lit view with the 7 key, and 4 will go back to wireframe. Now if you didn't catch that, let's take just a moment and write those down. <laughs> that should be a, a V and not a W. Whoa! Thank you, tablet. Four is wireframe. Five is what's called smooth shaded. Six is textured. And seven is lit. Now some of this, yeah, the viewport, that's hard to say, isn't it? Viewport. I know some of this uh, we won't be able to see the result of unless we create some textures and create some lights. And, you know, normally with a class, I wouldn't do that, but since this is a workshop, this is all a little bit more hands-on, I think it'd be fun for us to go ahead and just jump right in and create uh, a quick material with a texture. So what I want everybody to do is hit the six key. And if you hit the 6 key, your sphere is going to be very boring. Just click out in space to get away from it so you can just see the surface of it. Now, this view is supposed to show you a texture, and right now we have no textures to show. It's sad, but it's true. It's the way this works. Now, please understand, I am running Maya at a very low resolution uh, for the purpose of producing this webinar. Hopefully... You're running at a resolution which is uh, slightly higher than mine, so you get a little more screen space. I will be vying for as much uh, actual screen space as I can muster. So if I look like I'm really kind of cramped and moving a lot of windows around, don't worry. It's only because I am. So what I want you to do is go under Window, Rendering Editors, and open up the Hypershade. This is a part of the user interface which is hidden by default and its entire job is to allow you to make shaders or materials to coat the surfaces of your objects. Now it is a pretty complex window at first. There is some of it that we don't really need to see immediately. Uh, so if you take a look at this window, uh, on the left hand side we have the create panel which is broken up into two lists. We really only need the right hand list. So what I'm going to do is grab this little divider bar right here between these and just click and drag this over to the left. And that'll just simplify everything. Okay, so now it's time for us to create our first material. We're going to be doing this a few times today, so you might as well get used to it now. What I want you to do is click, middle click. So everybody has three buttons on their mouse, I'm hoping. If you don't think you do, it's probably under the mouse wheel, and you might not have known that, but hopefully you did. I want you to hold on your middle mouse button over the Fong material, and just drag that with middle mouse right out here into the work area. If for some reason you do not see the work area, maybe all you see is just this section, or maybe all you see is the work area, you can click on this little button that says show top and bottom tabs, and that should show uh, this upper tabbed area as well as the work area down below. So make sure you can see that. Alright, we've now created our very first material, and we should probably rename it, because naming things is generally pretty important. I'm going to right click and hold down the right mouse button on this object. Now Maya does this a lot. Instead of just giving you a pop-up menu, it gives you what is called a marking menu. That's what they call it, where you can move your mouse and you'll get this little rubber band line that allows you to select a variety of different options. 
Unfortunately, we don't really need any of these right now. We're just going to drag down to rename and release the mouse, and we're just going to call this My New Material and press Enter. Now, everybody who would like to follow along and click everything that I click, please make sure over in BuzzNet you've hit the Participate button, if you haven't already. If you're not following along with me, then that's perfectly fine. And from time to time, what I'm going to do is ask everybody to tell me if they're ready to go, if they're ready to move on beyond this. And if you are, you're just going to click Ready. Everybody do that now. Click Ready. Please. NATO, are you going to click Ready? Good, there's everybody who's clicked Ready. Uh, if at any point during this discussion you decide, yeah, if, if you can't and you're still at work, um, I totally understand, Scott, no worries. If, um, if any time along the way you have to bow out and you're not going to be following along anymore, please deactivate Participate so I'm not waiting for you uh, and wondering when you're going to catch up. Okay, now, uh, if you're working on something... And you're not yet finished. Uh, if, if I'm just, if I need to give you just a minute to catch up, you need to click the one minute status. Everybody, go ahead and set your status to one minute right now, please. Perfect. That's exactly what I want to see. And then at any point along the way, if I need to know where everybody is, I can reset you and set you all to not ready. So for everybody who's actually following along, why don't you go ahead and let me know if you've made it up to this point. If you're ready to move on, go ahead and set ready. If you're still doing stuff and creating your material, set your status to one minute. And this will tell me uh, how people are able to catch up. Uh, what window is Hypershade under? Uh, great question. Please, um, I would like to remind you, if you have an official question, I just happened to catch this one, okay? But sometimes questions get buried uh, in chat. So if you have an official question, I would ask that you please put that over in the webinar system. But it's totally cool this time around. Simply go under Window, Rendering Editors, and click on Hypershade. And that'll bring that right up for you. And uh, just waiting for a couple of folks to catch up, though I will give you guys uh, sort of a heads up. Generally, I am going to move on uh, with the greater number of the group. So it uh, looks like most everybody is ready to move on. So we have our material, but it has not yet been applied to our object. And an easy way to do that in Maya is with drag and drop. So what I'm going to do is just middle mouse drag this material on top of our sphere. Now you can see a little bit of a specular highlight appear in the middle of our object, which is, uh, that coincides with the fact that we have a Fong material. A Fong is, by default, a very shiny type of material. But we're not yet done. We need to apply a texture to this before we get too carried away. So I'm going to left drag this over here. If I use my left mouse button, I'm just dragging this node around and kind of repositioning it. I can also use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. So I'll zoom out just a little bit and give myself a little bit more space. And now if I scroll this list down, there are several different textures that I could apply. Now, I would recommend you keep things fairly simple. Some of the more complex textures uh, don't render immediately and you have to do special things to make them show up. So grab something fairly simple, like a bulge or a checker, or maybe a cloth. I'm going to grab a checker texture and just middle mouse drag this right next to my new material. And something very interesting happens when I do this. Now, this ties into Maya's node-based architecture, which is not something I'm going to be discussing too much right now, but at least you get exposed to it a little bit kind of early. Everything in Maya, everything that you see, is really the culmination of one or more nodes which build it up. So it's important, at least at the, the outset, so that you generally know what a node is, because we're going to be running into that word a lot. And if you really need a definition for a node, you can think of it like this. A modular component... that does one job. 
So one object may actually be the result of a series of nodes that come together to make it. Uh, now, uh, NATO just asked, is there a method of panning around the hypershade? Indeed, there is. Uh, I'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, now, so even here, in this case, we have created a checker texture. But there's two different parts to it. There's the algorithm that produces the checker pattern, and then there is what is called a place 2D texture node, and his job is to lay that texture out across a surface. So it's really two nodes to produce this effect. We're going to combine those with the existing node of our material. If you need to manipulate the, uh, the view around to kind of pan things around, you can hold down the Alt key and middle mouse drag which is also the same as the viewport manipulation for panning, which we'll get to here momentarily. I just want to get this uh, material kind of out of the way. Okay, so we, now, we want to connect this checker to our new material. I'm going to middle mouse drag on top of the new material and release. And we get this pop-up list of what we'd like to connect this to. So what I want you to connect this to is color. And if you take a look over here in the viewport, suddenly our sphere in the background is checker colored. If you don't see that checker pattern, you probably still need to hit the 6 key over here in your viewport. Make sure your viewport has focus and tap the 6 key. And what I want to do is get everybody to tell me uh, via their ready status when they get to this point. If you need a minute, please choose the 1 minute status. Pause real quick. Johan just asked if you can use the default connection. Generally, you should be able to. Sometimes, depending on what type of uh, texture you have selected or what type of node you have selected, default may not connect exactly where you think it should. So I prefer to choose exactly where I want things to connect. But yeah, I think in this case, in fact, I'll just try it. What the heck, right? If we select this wire, this connection that connects these two nodes together, by the way, check it out when you mouse over it. Look what it does. It tells you that checker one dot out color, meaning the output color from that node, is being fed into my new material dot color or the color of that material. Very handy feature. But I'll select that wire by clicking on it and hit delete to break the wire. And then we can just connect and choose default, and there you go. By default, this texture does happen uh, to add. Uh, right to the color. Now, um, Richard just asked, how do you add a texture to an object? Simply take the material. Here, here's the thing. You're generally not going to be adding a texture itself. This is a, check, uh, this is a texture, this checker that we've got here. You generally won't be adding this to an object. You'll want to do it by way of a material, which is why we built that Fong material first. Adding it to the object just simply requires that you middle mouse drag right on top of that object. There's another way to do it as well. If I uh, take Lambert 1 and middle mouse drag that back on top of the sphere, you can also do this. If you select the object, and hold down the right mouse button over it, you get this pop-up menu, and down here you'll see Assign Existing Material, and there's My New Material, and that will assign it as well. Incidentally, if you needed yet another way to do it, uh, you could go under uh, Lighting and Shading Menu. So right now I'm under the Rendering Menu set. If you wanted to do this whole thing with me, you need to go over to this little tiny drop-down and make sure that you are under the Rendering Menu set because this menu bar is so big, it's actually broken up into tabs. So we'll set this to the rendering menu set and go under lighting shading and choose assign existing material and we can choose my new material from there if we have something selected. There's all kinds of ways to do stuff in Maya. Uh, the easiest way I have found uh, is just to middle mouse drag. Uh, how do you make my new material into checker one? Well, we didn't actually. We have three nodes here. We have what was our Fong material, which we named My New Material. We have a checker texture, which is being applied to the color of that material. And we have a Place 2D Texture node, whose job is to control the placement of that texture across a surface. So to kind of repeat everything so that everybody gets a chance to see it, in fact, we could just go all the way. All we really did was, one, make a new material. I middle mouse dragged a Fong into place. Notice this is now Fong 2. Maya keeps track of those names internally. I'm going to hold down the right mouse button and go to Rename, and we'll name this My New Material. Drag that off to the side. Then I'll come down here to the checker pattern and just middle mouse drag this into the work area. It comes in with its own Place 2D Texture node by default. I can then middle mouse drag this straight over and connect that to color, and there you have it. So three nodes to make the whole thing. 
Now, because I had this material assigned to my sphere and I deleted that material, it does turn green. This is Maya's way of saying, hey, there is no material on this object, meaning it won't render, and that's a problem. So we'll just middle mouse drag my new material back on top of this. Now, why did I just go through all of that? In fact, let's go ahead and close out the hypershade. We don't really need it anymore for the time being. The only reason I wanted to go through all of that rigmarole was so that you could see these different viewport modes, where you can say we have four, the number four will take you to wireframe, five is smooth shaded, six is textured. So you can see the difference between whether or not you're showing those textures or not. And then finally we have seven, which shows you the result of all the lights. Do we have any lights in this scene right now? No, no we don't, of course not. So we need to add one. What I want everybody to do is go under create, and go down to lights and choose a point light. These are very basic and very easy to place. Now we're going to have to move this around, so we have to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, which is totally cool. Make sure that you have the, the move tool active. You can do that by tapping the W key or clicking on the move tool button here on the left hand side of the screen. In most cases you'll probably see it by default. And you should have these three arrows sticking out of your object. Just drag one of those arrows to pull that light out and maybe pull it up into the air. And now you should be able to test out all four of those view modes. You have wireframe, smooth shaded, textured, and lit. Now understand that textured and lit are kind of like toggles. So if we hit 5 to just go back to smooth shaded and then jump straight to 7, we see the result of just our lighting and not the texturing. And what I'd like to do is get everybody to use their ready status to let me know if they've made it up to this point. And if you need help with something, if you need to repeat something, please just drop a question over into uh, the webinar question system and I'll help you out as quickly as I can. Because that's what I do. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video for just a minute while folks sort of catch up. So I did get a question. I said, how do you dock items? I accidentally undocked the channel box. You mean you did something like this? So you now have a floating channel box. Isn't that the scariest thing in the world when that happens? Uh, if you just drag and drop that back over, I mean, if you see the attribute editor, it becomes really easy. If for some reason you don't have the attribute editor, you've got to drag it until you see the viewport kind of nudge back out of the way and then that'll go back into its original position. So you see a little tiny wiggle that the viewport does? That's how you know it's where it needs to be, and then it goes back. Now, if you see the attribute editor floating there, and you'll see it's labeled, uh, you can just drag it right on top of the attribute editor, and that'll do the same thing. So one of the two of those should put it right back where it should be. Again, please double check your ready status. I'm talking to you, Streeter and Paul. Uh, the two of you are still set to not ready, and I would rather you either be ready or set to one minute to let me know you're still working and that you haven't walked away from your computers. Now, I think you can also, like if you've done something like that and you've pulled something and or pulled something else off and you've got all these floating things kind of flying around your view, uh, you should be able to go to display, UI elements, and restore your UI elements. No, okay, that won't actually bring that back. But that's good to know. You, you should also just be able to close it. and No, that won't snap it back either. So yeah, just drag and drop. I was trying to get all fancy. Tricky. Okay, so I'm going to assume that Streeter and Paul are no longer following along. Are you guys still there? Because you're not updating your status anymore. And I really need you to stay on top of that. If you're not going to be updating your status, I would ask that you please uh, deactivate your participate status as quick as you can. And I will have to probably bug Nelson uh, to give me the ability to set people's status manually so that I can fix them when they're doing that. Uh, is middle mouse button dragging the shader, uh, or the blend if you've got one, uh, to the workspace the only way to get this node to the workspace? Uh, no, absolutely not. You can just click on the uh, the node that you want to create. So for instance, if I go back over to the hypershade, uh, let's say I want to make a blend for some reason, I can just click on a blend and that'll just bring it over. I'm just a really big fan of middle mouse dragging. Um, it's just, it's a habit that I got into and it's one of the ways that I teach, but you can just click on these like buttons and uh, that will create stuff as well. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about navigating this view because that's going to be the next big thing you're going to need to do. The Alt key is your big button. That's your big red shiny button for navigating the viewport. It's 
always going to be alt plus some mouse button. So alt plus left mouse button is tumbling. Alt plus middle mouse button is panning. Alt plus right mouse button is dollying, which if you call that zoom from time to time, I won't you know, hit you over the head or anything, but it is different than zooming. Zooming means you're actually changing the field of view of a camera, like you're actually adjusting the lenses. Dollying means you're moving the camera toward or away from the subject. And that's what you're actually doing here in Maya, is you're moving the camera toward or away from the object. Now, I do want to mention this. If you want to be all old school about it, uh, you can use uh, left mouse button and middle mouse button together and that will dolly your camera as well. That's the way it used to be before uh, Alias remembered that you actually have a right mouse button because apparently they forgot that at one point. So let's go over those real quick. Holding down Alt, drag with left mouse and you are tumbling. Drag with middle mouse and you are panning. And drag with right mouse and you're dollying in and out. You're pushing the camera toward and away from a subject. And yeah, uh, I know some people do think it, it feels weird to use left and middle mouse together. This is how I learned, actually. And I, the, over the years, I did you know, finally get used to the right mouse button, and I did adopt it. But for a while there, I mean, this is what you had. So that's what you got used to. You know what I mean? And there's a couple of other buttons you need to be aware of as well that will make your navigation much, much easier. Because it's possible that you can get lost. You can get yourself all kinds of flipped around and have no idea where you are. And you start looking and looking and looking, and you know whatever object you were trying to look at just keeps flying past you in the distance, and you can't tell what's going on, and it's all very, very scary. In those cases, you have two buttons that can save your life. You have the F key, which will frame up on a selected object. And you have the A key, which will frame up on all objects in the scene. So F and A, definitely keep those two buttons in mind. They will save your life. All right, now a couple of other things about the viewport that we'll go over uh, generally. We have a menu bar for the viewport, and we have a little toolbar. Generally, as a heads up, I do like to just let people know everything in the toolbar is buried in these menus. It's just here for quick and easy access. So what I'm going to do is just go over uh, the menus and generally what they're here for. And if you want to click and play with the buttons, uh, by all means do that. And if you have a specific question about how these buttons work or what they're doing, just ask. So we have the view menu. The job of the view menu is to control what your viewport is actually looking at and to give you access to camera settings. So one of the interesting things about Maya is that it does not differentiate the viewer and the camera. And what do I mean when I say that? If you're coming to Maya from another application such as uh, 3ds Max or, uh, or Blender, Blender is, uh, particularly has one view that you use when you're working and then if you want to render it, you need to create a camera. You need to have some sort of camera in your scene. Maya doesn't do that. You're always looking through a camera. If you wanted to create an entire movie and render it out using the perspective camera, which we're using right now, you could certainly do that with no problems. If you need to select that camera, because it is just a regular object, you can go under View and choose Select Camera, and here's all the camera's uh, animatable properties right here. Or you can go to the camera's attribute editor and change things like its focal length, which is like manually zooming it like you would a regular camera, or it's angle of view, which does the same thing using a, a different system. So it's just two approaches to accomplish the same thing. I'll set my focal length back to 35 millimeter. And there's some other things about the view menu as well that are pretty cool. You have next view and previous view. So if you've been cycling through your different views and maybe rotating steadily around an object and you think, well, I like the view I had before, you can just cycle back through your previous views. And that'll eventually take you back to where you were. And you have the ability to create bookmarks. A bookmark is useful if you have the perfect view of an object. For instance, let's say we think this is the perfect view of this sphere for some reason. We can go under View, Bookmarks, go to Edit Bookmarks, and we get this little tiny editor, which looks kind of scary, but there's really not much to it. You can just simply click on the new bookmark button, and you'll get a new bookmark, given it gets a name by default. In this case, it's camera view one. We'll call this my favorite view. And that gets renamed. When we're happy, just go ahead and click close. And now we can fly around, do whatever we want to, and at any time, go back to the view menu, 
Go over to bookmarks and there's my favorite view and that'll take you right back to where you were. That's the idea of bookmarks. Next menu, we have the, oh, I also just kind of want to mention, sort of off the cuff, that we're not going to be using them today. If you need to import image planes into your views, this is where you do it. Next, we have the shading menu. This controls how objects look in the viewport. So everything we were doing before, like switching between wireframe, smooth shading, uh, choosing whether things are, are lit or unlit, all of that is done right inside of here. We also have the ability to switch on X-ray, which looks pretty cool. i turn that off. Or we can switch everything to use the default material if our textures are getting a little bit too heavy for the machine. Moving over, we have the, the lighting menu. This allows us to see the result of our lights or just selected lights, which is really neat. For instance, if I have a light here and I hit Control D to, to uh, duplicate it and put another light maybe down here. So I have three lights in my scene right now. I can go under lighting and I can choose to see the result of all of my lights or just selected lights. So in this way, I can select a light and one by one I can see what it's contributing to my scene, which is very, very handy. Next menu is our show flags. This allows us to show and hide certain things. For instance, if I say lights and switch that off, you can no longer see my lights. You can still see the result of those lights, it just means they're not drawing in the viewport. They just don't happen to be there anymore. It also means we can't select them with the mouse, just incidentally. I'm going to go ahead and turn those back on. If I switch off polygons, for instance, those disappear. So we'll turn that back on. I can turn off the grid if I want to. I'll go ahead and leave that on. Uh, next, we have the renderer menu. This gives you access to three different viewport renderers in Maya 2013. You have the default renderer, you have the high quality render, which looks pretty good, and if your video card supports it, you have viewport 2.0, which is pretty fancy. I gotta admit, I do love viewport 2.0. Now, not all video cards support it, so you may need to check with Autodesk website to see if yours does. Uh, I am currently running a GTX 580, and it makes the uh, it makes viewport 2.0 sing pretty well. But I'll go ahead and set this back to the default quality renderer. We don't really need anything of, of super high fidelity at the moment. Finally, we have the panels menu. The panels menu is important in a lot of ways because it allows us to switch between different types of viewport. There are two viewport types that we have access to. And up to now, we've only been using one of them. This is a perspective viewport. It's a three-dimensional view that gives us a sense of depth in our scenes. But it's not the only type of viewport we have. We also have an orthographic viewport. An orthographic viewport is two-dimensional. It gives you no sense of depth whatsoever. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Uh, if you are unfamiliar with the concept of parallax, let me give you a really, really quick example. I'm going to take this sphere and hit Control D and move one of the copies way out here. And I won't even worry about using lighting. We don't need lights. They're just getting in the way. But notice right now, if I asked you, if you hadn't actually seen me move this viewport, if you just kind of walked into the room all of a sudden and I said, which of these two spheres is bigger than the other, you might stop and think and be kind of, you know, be like, well, it depends on where the camera is, if you were, you know, kind of a smart ass. Uh, but if you, uh, if you just glanced at it, your, your brain would probably tell you that this sphere is larger. And that's because of the sense of depth. However, orthographic views do not have this sense of depth. So if I switch over to an orthographic side view, and did I pull that in totally the wrong axis? Let me try the front view. Front view! Oh, you know why we don't see him? Because he's actually pulled past the plane of the camera. I love it when I do that on these examples. It makes me very happy. There we go. So even though one of these spheres is, is way in front of the other one, they both appear to be exactly the same size because an orthographic view shares no depth whatsoever. Now, here's the fun thing. You actually have three orthographic views visible at all times. If you are hovering over your perspective view right now, you can tap the space bar, and this will bring up what is called the four view. The four view gives you the perspective view in the upper right, the upper left is the top view, lower left is the front view, lower right is the side view. 
Now, if you're totally new to 3D and you just really like seeing this perspective view and having this kind of godlike control over 3D space, I totally understand. But uh, I do try to suggest to newcomers not to discount the orthographic views. They are highly important when you're doing precision work and you need to have something p uh, placed in a precise and exact location. So definitely remember that they're there and use them to your advantage. Because, for instance, if I wanted to take one of these spheres and set it directly on top of the first one, so let's take this guy and I'll set him right over here. If I try to do that in perspective, I'd have to move this over here. I could, okay, so I see he's behind. I need to move him up and maybe a little bit forward and maybe over here. And then I'm still not dead on, so I kind of need to rotate the view around and look at it from this angle and try to get that lined up, then come over here. And he's still not precise, so i got to wiggle him over here. And there's just a whole lot of work. However, if I just use my orthographic views, we can start, say, in the top view and just place one of the spheres directly on top of the other, as precise as we want to, and then come over here to the side view, slide him up a little bit, and there we go. Nice, fast, precise motion without having to wo uh, wobble the viewports around in a whole bunch of different directions. So definitely keep the orthographic views in mind. Okay, now again I mentioned the toolbar is really just a bunch of commands that are already inside of these menus. Some of the more popular ones that I like to use. Uh, you do have one click access to the camera attribute editor if you need that for some reason. I do like uh, having access to that when I want it. Uh, you can turn the grid on and off, which generally speaking I find myself doing um, when I'm checking something out in an orthographic view. Sometimes I use the grid, sometimes I kind of want it out of my way. I think these days with the new interface uh, I generally want it out of my way more often than I want to be staring at it, but that's all personal preference of course. You also have access to some of your view modes. You have wireframe, smooth shade all, wireframe on shaded, which is pretty cool when you need it. Of course you have textured, which is already on. You have lit, which you can turn on and off. And we have a few other modes as well, such as uh, showing shadows or the high-quality render, which we're not going to worry about right now. Okay, so are there any questions up to this point? Everybody just a, a second if you want to think of one, throw one in, and then we'll move on from here. There is another part to using Maya. Uh, it's not just specific to the viewport. I'm so used to thinking of it as being a part of the viewport, however, and that is the hotbox. The hotbox, you'll find if you were tapping the spacebar, it flickered there for just a minute, but if you hold down the spacebar, the purpose of the hotbox is to give you quick access to any and all of the menus available inside of Maya. At the moment, since we haven't really talked about the rest of the interface, I'm not going to dwell too much on the hotbox, aside from the, the fact that I just kind of want you to know that it's here, and we'll go into it a little bit more here in just a moment. All right, does everybody understand the viewports reasonably well? Just give me a yes or a no over inside of BuzzNet right now, if you please. Okay, that's great. So let's take a quick look at the rest of the Maya interface, because it does look like there's a lot here. And let's be honest, there is a lot here. However, it's uh, it's not that intimidating once you know what it is. Now, let's, let's see. Um, Richard just said, my viewport says 2D pan zoom persp. What does that mean? Uh, that means that you probably clicked uh, the 2D pan button which I believe you can find under camera tools. It also has a button uh, here in the, the view as well. So you can turn this on. And what this allows you to do is to move your view two-dimensionally as if you were sliding a piece of paper. If you want to turn that back off, just go ahead and click on its button one more time. It looks like a little tiny uh, magnifying glass with a little crosshair next to it. Okay, so walking around the rest of the interface. Starting at the very top of the menu bar, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, you're welcome to take a look at any of these menus and see the types of things that are found in them, but at a glance, okay? You have uh, things like file, has probably exactly what you'd expect to find. Uh, new file, open stuff, import stuff, recent files, etc. and so forth. Edit's going to have undo and redo. Two very important commands. In fact, they're so important, let's talk about them for just a second. The hotkeys for most of these commands can be found inside the menus. Here, of course, you see Control-Z and Control-Y. You can use Control-Z and Control-Y in Maya, which is cool. Hit Control-Z, Control-Y for redoing. But that's kind of the newer way to do it. The old way to do it I actually found was more convenient for me, uh, but it is different than any other app out there. Undo is just attached to the Z key. So if you do something you don't want to do, you can just tap Z and immediately undo it. You don't have to hold down Control if you don't want to. If you want to redo something, hold down Shift and Z. 
Now, in that regard, that brings up an important point that you need to be aware of in Maya. I can't stress this enough. As a matter of fact, I'm going to write it in great, big, frightening letters. Remember the caps lock. Most of the buttons that I'll be uh, telling you, remember the 5th of November, very good. Uh, most of the buttons that I'll be showing you today in terms of hotkeys have entirely different functionality if caps lock is down. So please remember that Maya is very touchy about case sensitivity. So a regular lowercase z is undo, but capital Z or shift Z is redo. And there's a lot of different features like that. So uh, just as another, for instance, a regular lowercase w is the move tool. A capital W keyframes translation. So you'd be putting a movement key down. So yeah, definitely keep that sort of stuff in mind. You, you want to really keep an eye on your caps lock key because few things will frustrate you more than having caps lock on, spamming a whole bunch of buttons, wondering why stuff isn't working, and then realizing you put keyframes on everything and all kinds of stuff is just not working the way it should. So monitor your caps lock key. Okay. Edit's also going to have access to things like duplicate, group, and parent, things that we will be talking about today, as well as the almighty delete by type history. Just remember that I pointed that out to you for later today because construction history is a major feature inside of Maya. Next we have the display menu. This allows you to just kind of control what it is you're looking at and how you see it. Uh, things like your UI elements that you can show and hide through the UI elements uh, menu or various aspects of certain objects. Like for instance, we have a polygon submenu where we can turn on things like face normals. And so now this selected sphere looks like it's got hair. But what this is doing is showing you what side of these, each of these polygons is the positive side that is pointing outward. So go ahead and go back under display, polygons, face normals, and we'll turn that back off. We have the window menu. This gives you access to all of the different parts of Maya's user interface. They're all found here somewhere inside the window menu. And there are a lot of them, to be sure. But it's really not so bad. You, in a lot of cases, you will not need to use absolutely every single part of the user interface on your projects. The Assets menu is here to help you with the creation and control the editing of assets. An asset is where you take an entire group of different objects, maybe an entire rigged character, or maybe an entire set with various props and lights and whatnot, and you condense that into a single object, and you can publish various properties of that object to the top of the asset. It's a little bit outside of our scope for today's lecture, but I do kind of want you to know why it's here. Now, if I jump all the way to the end, there are a couple of other menus uh, that you may or may not see on your installation. For instance, I've installed the bonus tools, but you may not have done that, so you may not see this. Uh, the muscle and pipeline cache are outside our scope, but we do have the help menu, which is exactly what you think it is. And it gives you access to a whole bunch of important things that will help you learn how to use Maya or help you when you're stuck. Now, all of these menus that took place in the middle here, we had lighting, shading in my case, uh, texturing, render, tune, stereo, paint effects, and so forth. These are all different depending on what menu set you are in. In short, there are so many menus available inside of Maya that they had to be broken up into different menu sets. And you can change between these menu sets in two ways. One is with this drop down here in the status line. And the other is with hotkeys. The F2 key will take you to the animation menu set. F3 will take you to polygons. F4 will take you to surfaces or NURB surfaces if you're familiar with the term. F5 will take you to dynamics, and F6 will take you to rendering. At this time, there is no hotkey to take you over to the in dynamics menu set for uh, things like end particles or uh, in hair, that sort of thing. So just definitely be aware of that. If you want to get to those, you need to use the little drop down, at least for now, until they fix that. I don't think they've incorporated anything like shift F5, though. That would probably take care of it if they wanted to do that. Okay, so that is a quick rundown of the menu bar. 
Moving down from here, we have the status line. Now, in most other applications, you would look at this and probably think it was a toolbar. And while it has some aspects that are similar to a toolbar, it is wildly different. The purpose of the status line is to tell you the state that Maya is currently in. It even starts here with a drop-down for the menu set. Uh, because you can actually see what state the menu bar is currently in. Right now it's in the dynamic state, but I can switch it to the polygon state. Now, I had this collapse, but you, so you can see a lot of these sections of the status line are collapsible. You can click on these little tiny lines uh, with a little square in the middle, and they'll collapse down. So it's a triangle when it's collapsed. It's a little thin rectangle when it's expanded. So this next section, we have a, some hot buttons for um, a new scene. Open and save. I never ever use these. As a matter of fact, I generally leave that collapsed because new scene is control N, open is control O, and save is control S. Exactly what you would think they would be. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, next, you have a selection mask, which allows you to control what you can and cannot select at any given time. So uh, this allows me to turn off or turn on certain objects to make sure that I can select them. So right now, I have deselected the ability to select polygons. I'll go ahead and leave that at all objects for now. The next section is a further way to kind of trim down what you can and can't select. So the first area allows us uh, here, allows us to set whether or not we want to be able to select by hierarchy. Right now that's not going to mean much to us and we're not going to worry too much about it. That will uh, become kind of important a bit later. We can select by object type or by component type, and this is really cool. Uh, if anybody in here is, I mean, I realize most of you are probably new to Maya, but if you have any experience with 3D animation whatsoever, you've heard of the concept of modeling or shaping out three-dimensional objects, and right here is really the crux of where you start modeling, because when you're in object mode, you're dealing with an entire object. Or you can switch over to component mode, and you can start manipulating the components that make that object up. Which, right here, what I'm doing, this is the very heart of modeling. Grabbing polygon vertices and moving them around. Which I'm going to undo a few times. And if you want to get really fancy, you can select one of these vertices. If you're with me. Hold down the B key, B as in boy, or bravo. And then middle mouse drag. And you have soft selection. It's great. It's amazing. It's so much fun. And then rotate that. And we no longer have a sphere. We've got some strange... It's like the front of a boat! Does that not look like the front of a boat? I think it does. And we got it in like just a few clicks. But I'm going to undo it anyway. Sorry, I'm, I'm amazed by the very, very simple. Okay, so there is the ability to switch between object type and component type. Now, for each one of those modes, we have a series of masks over here to control what we can and can't select. So that's the next section. So, for instance, here in object mode... I can turn off surfaces. You can see the icon. It looks like a little surface. And with that off, I can no longer select anything that is a surface. I can still select lights, however. So if I leave those on and I turn off anything that is renderable, like rendering objects, that will include lights, and now I can't select lights. Now, if you want to know what's included under each one of these buttons, you can right-click on them, and you can be very selective about what you can and can't select. So, for instance, we could just say we can't select poly surfaces, but we could still select any NURB surfaces that were in our scene. So if I wanted to create one real quick, I'm going to create NURBs primitives and make a sphere. I'll just drag that out. So I have some polygon spheres and a NURB sphere. So if I go back under here and right-click and switch off the ability to select polygons, I can't select these guys. Click as I might, but I can still select the NURB sphere. So it's just a way to be selective about what you can and cannot actually click on and select. If you use the little arrow here on the far left, you can decide to switch everything off. And now nothing can be selected. Very nice if you don't want to accidentally bump into something and break it. We'll go ahead and turn everything back on. Next to this, we have the ability to lock or unlock a current selection. So for you max people who like to be able to lock a, a given selection, you can do that just by clicking. And now I can't unselect this sphere. In fact, if I try to drag the mouse, I'm probably going to be moving it because it's currently locked. I can't do anything else until I'm done with that. Now I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. We have our section over snapping. I'm not going to get carried away in a, a discussion of snapping just yet, but you have the ability to snap to the grid, to snap to any curves that you have in your scene, to snap to individual points, as well as to snap to any view planes, which we don't have any in our current scene, or to make an object live. I'll show you guys making live here in just a little while. That is pretty cool. 
Now I'm going to jump ahead a couple of more buttons, and this button right here may be, as far as I'm concerned, the most important button in the status line. You're probably never going to use it, but the reason it's the most important is that if you forget about it and it gets turned off, few things in this world will frustrate you quite this much. I've actually seen people completely reinstall Maya more than once to try to solve the problem of having this button switched off. What this does is this turns off construction history. Everything that you do to an object in Maya, whether you're modeling it, whether you're trying to animate it, or whether you're trying to uh, skin it to a, to a skeleton so it'll deform, it's all in some way dependent on construction history. When you turn off construction history, the nodes that make an object, uh, the, uh, the nodes that make history that allow you to edit what you've done in the past are not created. Here's what I mean. If that sounds in any way confusing, I can explain really quickly. Let me delete these objects. I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to create a polygon sphere, just like we did before. Notice this guy has an input node. It's over, over here down in the channel box, under inputs, you see polysphere 1. This is kind of like the blueprints of this sphere, and I'll talk more about input nodes a little bit later. But look at its properties. We have things like radius, subdivisions axis, subdivisions height. So you can really do a lot of editing to this sphere. That's because construction history is on. If I turn that off and I create another sphere, notice there is no input node. So I don't have the ability to go back and edit that. I just have a regular sphere. That's kind of, that can be very problematic and very frustrating if you don't know about this button. I will give you kind of a tip. Uh, in all 10 of the years or 10 or more that I've been using Maya, I have never needed to turn that button off. I'm not saying you won't. I'm just saying that generally speaking, you don't need it. Okay, next to this we have some various render buttons, which I use these a lot. Uh, we have the ability, I guess if I throw something in here so that we can render, that's probably going to be better. Uh, we can open up our render view, which there's the last render I actually did. We can make a new render. So there's my kind of eclipsed, mysteriously lit sphere, which looks really cool, actually. Uh, we can open up the IPR render, which is not something we're probably going to be talking about today. But this gives you the ability to have mostly interactive rendering. And I say mostly because not everything is interactive. Some things do not update, uh, and others do. But it is a very neat feature, uh, even though I don't use it that very much these days. Uh, we have display render settings. This is the render globals window. If you need to change how many frames you want to render, if you want to change the resolution of your render, if you want to change any of the settings of the rendering engine that you're utilizing, so maybe you want to use things like global illumination or any of those fancy things that Mental Ray can do, you're going to set all of that up here inside the render settings window. And it looks like two little circles next to a clapboard. Now, next to this, we have some entry fields where we can type in various values. Now, uh, this starts off with a button on the far left-hand side to control whether this is absolute or relative transformations. So, for instance, if I have this set to absolute and I take X and set it to 10, that moves my object to 10 in the X-axis. You can verify that here in the channel box. His translate X is now set to 10. If I set this to relative and I punch in 10, can anybody tell me where it's going to be next? Anybody? Over in BuzzNet, I'm trying to see who's awake and who isn't. Is BuzzNet dead? If you can hear my voice, let me know. Oh, BuzzNet's not dead. That's good. It will move! Where will it move to? Somebody give me its coordinates in X right now. If I was to punch in 10 and press Enter, what's going to happen? Somebody. Who gets a cookie? 10 units to X. Move 20. Well, that's, I think people are getting there. Let's go ahead and press Enter, and it moves to 20. This is relative motion. So now if I put 5, it moves to 25. If I put negative 10, it moves back to 15. So it's all relative to where it was originally, as opposed to absolute, which will just put it at that specific coordinate location. So if I now set this to 10, it goes back to translate x of 10. So you see how that works. Okay, good to know people are still here. All right, now, down from here we have the shelf. This is just a toolbar. That's all it is. Except it's such a big toolbar that it's broken up into a series of tabs, like so. 
And generally speaking, you're just going to set this to whatever you happen to be doing. If you know you're working with polygons, you'll set this to the polygons tab and maybe use some of these buttons. Honestly, these days, I don't use the shelf for very much anymore. The shelf is editable and does allow you to create your own buttons on the shelf. Uh, you can create your own buttons by digging stuff out of the menu. So uh, if I jump over to the polygons tab, and I know that deleting history is an important thing for me, I can hold down Control and Shift and go under Edit, Delete by Type, History, and now check it out. I have a button over here in my shelf specifically for deleting history. I no longer have to dig that out of the menu. I can just click on that at any time. I can delete this button just by middle mouse clicking it and dragging it onto this trash can. So you can clean up your shelves that way as well. Okay, so that's a quick rundown of the shelf. On the left-hand side, we have the toolbox. In my experience, just for me personally, and I'm not being judgmental here, this is probably the part of the user interface I use the least. Uh, it does have a couple of buttons that I don't really access anywhere else. So like the paint selection tool is pretty handy because I don't know of a hotkey to actually get to that. Uh, but this is where you can access the select tool, the move tool, the rotate tool, and the scale tool. Now the reason I don't use them that much is because those are all attached to hotkeys. We have Q for select, W for move, E for rotate, R for scale. And if those sound familiar, Unity uses them, 3ds Max uses them, I think even Soft Image uses them now. So, I, But I do like to just state that Maya had them first. So real quick. Select is W. <laughs> Thank you. Select is Q, Zachary. Move is W. Rotate is E. And scale is R. And they do kind of just continue from there. Okay, so I, I just want to get through the user interface as quick as I can, so if you guys will just bear with me, we're almost done here. Now, the first part of the toolbar, again, is just giving you access to some tools, things like uh, lasso selection. Uh, we have the universal manipulator. I'm not a fan of this at all, but if you want to play with it, you can click on it. Uh, it gives you a series of handles that surround the bounding box of the object that allow you to uh, move or rotate or scale an object. And as cool as it looks, um, the reason I don't like it is that you can't really animate it with it. Uh, if you wanted to, say, make a box. And let's say I just make a little box, just like so. And I wanted to use the universal manipulator to make this rock around like it was, you know, like it was a box. I can't animate it this way. This looks really neat, doesn't it? Doesn't it look like a box rolling off the screen? Uh, here's what I mean. And I'm just going to give you a really quick example of what I'm talking about. Uh, here at frame one, I'm going to place keyframe on rotation. And what the heck, we'll do translation as well. And we'll come over here to 10. And I'll roll this, rock this guy over on his side. And then 20. And rock this guy over on his side. And there's what you get. So notice that translate X and uh, X, Y, and Z are not updating, even though the object's position has changed due to it rotating from different pivot points. So as long as you're not animating, I guess this is kind of useful, but I'm kind of, just me personally, I'm kind of against it. I, I have a, a rough time accepting it as a tool. Uh, we have the soft modification tool. It's neat, but we're not, I generally don't use it anymore because soft modification is now built into the move tool. That's kind of a, a legacy feature, and I don't find myself using it all that often. We have the show manipulator tool. Not going to be useful until we get into modeling. And then whatever our last operation was. So I created a, a polygon cube last, so now we see a button here for creating another polygon cube. The rest of the toolbox, you can't actually see because I'm doing so low resolution to record this video. Uh, but you have the ability to break your panel up into different layouts. So we have the single view, the four view, and then here I have the perspective view and the outliner. And the outliner is just kind of a list of everything that is currently in your scene, which is very cool. Now this brings us over to uh, the far side of the, the view. I'm going to go over this very quickly just so that we can kind of move on. We have the channel box and the layer editor. Are there any Photoshop users in the room? Yes, uh, there's one person. I am trying to make sure that people are still here and hanging out with me, so if you are still listening in any way, I do appreciate it if you occasionally interact with me in BuzzNet, if you can. 
Okay, well, if you've used Photoshop in the past, and even if you haven't, uh, Photoshop allows you to take your work and break it up into a series of layers, and Maya allows you to do the same thing, which is what the layer editor is all about. We're not going to be getting into it right now, but that's why it's here. Now, we also have the channel box up here up at the top. The purpose of the channel box is to give you access to all attributes of an object that you can animate. Anything that can be, and just want to say that again, anything that can be animated is available here inside the channel box. Then you have the attribute editor. The attribute editor gives you access to all of the attributes of an object, whether they are animatable or not, across all of the different nodes that make that object up. Everything you see in Maya is the culmination of a series of nodes that make that happen. And right here, we have just a sphere, but if we look inside the attribute editor, we see there are several nodes that make this sphere possible. We have its input node, we have its shape node, we've got its transform node, its shading group node, and then finally we have the node for the material that's been applied to it. All of those nodes are all working in concert to give us this final object. And the purpose of the attribute editor is to give us access not only to those nodes, but to all of the properties found within them. Okay, are there any questions so far before we go over the last few parts of the interface? Yes, no, give me something. Again, I'm trying to wake people back up because I feel like when I, when I just talk about things like the UI, uh, your eyes start to glaze over and people start kind of... You know, eh. Okay, so folks are still with me. Are people still with me? How are you guys feeling right now? How's it going? Good. Sajiro's awesome. High five, Sajiro. We're going to be doing a break here in just a second. I just want to finish off the rest of the user interface and I don't have long to go. So thank you very much. Okay, so the last few parts of the interface are all pretty straightforward. We have the time slider across the bottom of the screen. You've already seen me use this a little bit, and we will be using it later today. This allows you to update what frame you're currently on for animation purposes. So just for, as a really fast, for instance, if I have this sphere and I hit Shift W or do a capital W and then move my time slider to frame 24 and move my sphere over and hit Shift W again, I now have animation and I can drag my time slider to see that animation. We have some playback buttons, so I can hit play and see that play. Or I can stop, I can play backwards, I can rewind and I can fast forward. I can step one frame at a time to see how things are playing back. Or I can jump in between keyframes as well. You can also just punch in an exact keyframe you want to go to. So if I just take this number field and punch in, say, 12, that'll take me, oh, well, I think I hit 15 instead. That takes me right to frame number 15. Now, underneath this, we have what is called the range slider. This is kind of like a zoom tool for the time slider. It allows you to control how many frames you see in the time slider and to move that range around. So, for instance, right now, the range slider says that we're looking between frames 1 and 24. If I grab this handle and drag it out, we're now looking between frames 1 and 36. And I can take that range and slide it up and down the entire timeline. That's pretty intuitive, I think. Now, at the same time, you have these number fields on either side of the range slider. On the far left, you have the actual start frame for the animation. On the far right, you have the end frame for the animation. So between these two inner and outer fields, you have the number of frames that are in your animation. The two inner fields allow you to see what the current range slider is set to. So if you want to punch in some numbers to set that. For instance, I could take this number and set it to 15. And you see the range slider updates to accommodate that. And as I drag this range around my timeline, you'll see those two inner numbers update as well. Now there's some other buttons over here that we're not going to be using today. We have animation layers and character sets, much more important when you get into complex characters with uh, advanced rigs. We have the auto key button, which is massive, and I really, really love it, but it's really easy to kind of bite you in, in the butt if you forget that it's there and you leave it on when you don't mean to. But the purpose of auto key is such that if you have two keyframes, which I do, I have this animation, which is two keyframes, with here and going to here. If I put my time slider right in the middle and just make any change, a keyframe is automatically placed because Maya updates that information. So it automatically keyframes based on changes that I make, which is very fancy. 
How do you remove keyframes? Well, there's a bunch of ways to do it. I could just right click right here and just uh, choose delete. So I can just put myself right on the frame uh, with the selected object, right click and choose delete, and that pulls that right out again. Or I could remove it through the graph editor, which we'll be taking a look at a little bit later today when we start actually animating some stuff. But uh, usually the way I do it is I'll just go right here inside the timeline and just delete uh, that particular key. Uh, you can also delete it uh, systematically here inside the channel box if you wanted to. For instance, we're not really using translate Y. You'll see that it's not doing anything. So we can right click on that and we can delete out anything connected to it, and that removes those keyframes. So now translate Y is no longer animated. And since all we animated was Z, we could do the same thing with X. Okay, now, that's the range slider and the time slider. Down from here we have the uh, command line. This allows you to put in MEL or Python commands. Currently it's set to MEL. If you click this little button here, that toggles between MEL and Python. But just uh, here's your first mail command if you have never used mail before. You can just type in sphere and press enter. And that made a little tiny NURB sphere for us. So if I delete that and do that command again, I can do that just by tapping the up arrow key. It, just, it remembers that. And press enter. There you go. That's the mail command to make a basic NURB sphere. Uh, this uh, line is broken up into a couple of different sections. You have the command section where you type in your mail commands, and then you have a result line, which is where uh, mail will give you some feedback. Or if you uh, give it a command that doesn't exist, like uh, do... Actually, <laughs> finding Nemo. Uh, cannot find procedure finding Nemo. So, unfortunately, guys, I'm sorry. There is no one single command to make finding Nemo in Maya. Hate to break it to you. Uh, at the very bottom, you have the helpline. The job of the helpline is to kind of tell you what you should be doing in any given moment based on what you have selected. So right now, I have the Move tool selected, and it says Select an Object to Move. Once I select an object, it gives me more instructions. Use the manipulator to move the objects. Use Edit Mode to change uh, the pivot, or just hit the Insert key. And use Control plus Left Mouse to move perpendicularly. So it, it helps you in every way that it can. And NATO wants me to try and make MMO. I already tried that one doesn't work. All right, so that is a quick rundown of the Maya user interface, at least the visible side of it. Now, from here on out, we will be using other parts of the interface, which I'll just introduce as we get to them. Are there any questions up to this stage? And it doesn't look like any are rolling in. So let's take a break. Uh, let's take about uh, 10 minutes, and then when we get back, we'll move on with the rest of the lecture. And I'll go ahead and stop the video at this point, and you can just, if you're watching this video, you can continue on the next one.